Okay, so now we have Ali Mustafa Tzade uh, from Turkey, Koch University in Istanbul. And uh, the topic is formulation of stationary scattering in terms of the dynamics of a non-stationary, non-unitary quantum system. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's a great pleasure and honor to be able to talk here and celebrate uh, Viktor Dodonov's 75th uh, birthday. So this is a work uh, mostly done with collaboration with um, Farhang Loran, which is a former student from Isfahan University of Technology in Iran. <coughs> so the outline, I'll be begin with a very uh, straightforward uh, an easy introduction to stationary scattering and the notion of transfer matrix in one dimension. Then I'll talk, to you, talk about what I mean by dynamical formulation of stationary scattering in one dimension and then extend it to, do, to two dimensions. This is actually the only fundamental alternative to the standard formulation of scattering theory, which is based on lippmann schoenger equation. And I will talk about three of the specific applications of this formulation of scattering theory, and then summarize its generalization to three dimensions, electromagnetic scattering, and conclude with some comments at the end. So what I mean by stationary scattering is standard textbook scattering problem, then you have a potential, which is a short range potential, which means it dies off faster than one over distance, and I allow it to even be complex and even energy dependent. And once you have this condition on the rate of the decay, uh, it allows you to prove that asymptotically all solutions of the Schrodinger equation are plane waves. So if you look at plus or minus infinity, you have right going and left going plane waves. A's and B's are coefficients of the right going and left going waves, and uh, there is a matrix which connects these coefficients. It's a two by two matrix, which is supposed to be independent of A's and B's, and it is unique by this condition, which is called a transfer matrix. This is very old, 1940s. Now, among solutions of the, uh, the Schrodinger equation, there are so-called scattering solutions. They're, they come in two sorts. One of them is a left incident scattering solution where you have an incident wave which corresponds to a source put at x equals to minus infinity and then parts of it reflects back and par parts of it is transmitted and R's and R and T are reflection and transmission amplitudes. And you can also send your incident wave from the right from x equals to plus of infinity and then again you have reflected and transmitted waves. And just these are particular examples of this general form. So if you use these choices of A's and B's in the expression for the transfer matrix, you can easily show that the reflection and transmission amplitudes are given as ratios of entries of transfer matrix. Therefore, if you can compute the transfer matrix, you have solved the scattering problem. It's if and only if. Scattering um, transfer matrix has all the information about the scattering problem exactly like this matrix. <coughs> if you, you can write its entries in terms of trans, uh, transmission and reflection amplitudes, and it is also very interesting because zeros of the entries of this matrix have important information. If you look at the real zeros of M11, this gives you what is called time reverse specter singularity, or co uh, coherent perfect absorption. This is the, the notion of spectral singularity corresponds to the real zeros of M22. This is a, a notion invented by mathematician uh, in 1950s. And 14 years ago when I attended this conference, I presented my work on spectral singularity, the physics of spectral singularity, which turned out to be the basic mathematics of all lasers. The zeros, the real zeros of the off-diagonal elements correspond to reflectionlessness 
from left or right. Non-real zeros of M22 give you bound state resonances, anti-resonances. So this, you see this M is a very, very useful object. If M happens to be identi identically the one matrix, identity matrix, then it means that the reflection should be zero and the transmission should be one. Therefore, the potential is completely invisible. It doesn't scatter, doesn't change the incident wave any, in any way. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition for bidirectional invisibility. Invisibility means that it must be reflectionless and the transmission should be one. So it doesn't even get a face. That's why it's invisible. Okay. Now, the most important property of the transfer matrix, which made it very popular, is its composition property. Suppose you have a potential V, which you can dissect into two pieces, such that V1 and V2 have supports to the left and right of some number A. That's uh, one of them vanishes for X bigger than A, the other vanishes for uh, X less than A, and they add up to V. Now, if V is a scattering potential, so are V1 and V2, so I can associate transferred matrices for all of them, V1, V2, V, I'll call them M1, M2, M, and then you can show that the transfer matrix for the potential is the product of the transfer matrices of pieces. And the order is important, these are matrices, they don't commute, and has to do with the position of the supports. Support of one is to the right of the support of the other. Now, exactly 10 years ago, I, it occurred to me that this composition property is almost identical to the way we compose evolution operators in quantum mechanics. Suppose you have a quantum system, you want to evolve it from time t0 to t2, and you can evolve it to an intermediate time by u1 and then evolve from t1 and t2, and the evolution from t0 to t2 will be the product, and it will be in the, sort, the same order. So I ask myself, well, can I find a quantum system whose evolution operator gives the, tra the transfer matrix of a given scattering potential? Just out of a curiosity. Well, remember, the evolution operator satisfies the Schrodinger equation. It's an initial time. It is identity matrix. I'm talking about two by two matrices now. And you can write the Schrodinger equation as an integral equation and iter iterate this. You get what's called a Dyson series. And here, the Hamiltonian depends explicitly on time. So you don't have just exponential. You have time-ordered exponential. Now. It turned out that I was right. You give me a scattering potential, I can find this Hamiltonian whose evolution operator evaluated at minus infinity to plus infinity is precisely the transfer matrix of the potential. Now, here x, which was the space, plays the role of time. The form of the Hamiltonian is universal. The potential comes as a coefficient, which is, and this is unique, which is interesting. Therefore, the transfer matrix admits a Dyson series expansion, which is actually very useful for perturbation theory. Why? Because you see V is proportional to V. Uh, H is proportional to V. Therefore, the terms are involve powers of V. So if you have a weak potential, this is a perturbation series. And you can do perturbation calculation using this. It's very useful. <laughs> like second order perturbation likes the three lines. These are two by two matrices. You can also write the Hamiltonian in this form in terms of this uh, matrix uh, one, one minus one minus one. This is the Pauli, diagonal Pauli matrix. The reason I write like this, because we will go to the two dimensions and you'll see that this, potent, this matrix is common to play into two dimensions. And what is important is that this Hamiltonian is obviously not Hermitian. It's not even diagonalizable. And it has spectrum zero, one eigenvector. 
This is the worst thing you can imagine. But you give me any sketching problem, I can write it in terms of the evolution of dynamics generated by this Hamiltonian. So non-Hermitian Hamiltonians are there even if your potential is real. It turns out that when potential is real, this is what I call pseudo-Hermitian. I worked on this theory of pseudo-Hermitian Hamiltonians 20 years ago. <coughs> now, I was giving a conference in my hometown, Tabriz, in Iran in 2013, and one of the people in the audience, Farhan Loran, which was my former student, asked me, can you do this for two and three dimensions? And my immediate answer was no. <laughs> Why? Because I thought, well, in one dimension, I have an ordering online, and this transfer matrix somehow uses that ordering. In two dimensions, there is no ordering. Uh, a month later, he visited me in Istanbul, and we started to think whether we can actually do it, achieve the impossible, which was very easy, because although there is no given ordering, the scattering problem introduces an ordering, because there is a scattering axis. So, Again, uh, the scattering is defined by the short range potential, which I allow to be complex valued. And I use polar coordinates or R theta. And then you can show that the scattering solutions of the Schrodinger equation have this asymptotics, where F is the scattering amplitude that you're looking for. Solution of the scattering problem means finding this F. K0 is the incident wave vector in two dimensions. Um, uh, I introduced this curly f and fk. The f is set of all uh, functions of variable p, and fk are all functions of variable p, which vanish outside the interval minus k to k. Now, the general solution of this will be plane waves asymptotically. So if you use... Um, Fourier analysis, you can express the general solution in terms of this integral. This omega of p is essentially square root of k squared minus p squared. You want to be to have uh, asymptotic plane waves, so this omega should be uh, real. Therefore, the integral should go from minus k to k. Otherwise, it becomes decaying and growing. That give you unbounded solutions, and scattering means you want bounded solutions. So I've taken the x-axis to be my scattering axis. This is the general solution. Now the coefficients of the Fourier modes, which will depend on this variable p, uh, is almost the same as a's and b's in one dimension. The only difference is that they are not numbers, they are functions. And I can extend their definition to a whole real line by demanding that outside the interval minus k, k, they are zero to make them unique. And then once I have A's and B's, I define the transfer matrix exactly like in one dimension, but with a big difference. Now, A's and B's are functions, and this M hat, although it's a two by two matrix, but its entries are linear operators. Actually, they turn out to be integral operators. So this looks fine, but is it useful? <laughs> So is, does it have the same properties as the good old transfer matrix of one dimension? Can I use it to solve scattering problem? Does it have the composition property of one dimensional analog? Okay, to do that, well, first, again, I can define left incidence and right incidence with respect to my scattering axis. So if uh, the source is here, that's x equals to minus infinity line, I call a left incident, and then this scattering, um, the incident angle is between minus 90 degrees and 90 degrees because it goes to the right. And I can also put the source here, and then the angle goes from uh, 90 degrees to 270 degrees because it should go to the left, okay? Well, these, I suppose I have detectors, these orange uh, semicircles are detectors I have put on my plus and minus infinity lines. And the source is either to the left infinity or to the right infinity. Okay, now I have this general solution, asymptotics, and the asymptotics of the scattering wave. So that means I should be able to choose A's and B's to generate this, right? 
Now, to generate a plane wave, here, uh, one of these should be a delta function. So if I am interested in a right incident wave, the wave comes from the right, there is no right going wave at x equals to plus infinity. That means that a minus should be zero. And b plus should give me the delta function which makes this factor uh, the plane incident wave, okay? And with, I can also <coughs> show with some asymptotic analysis that the scattering amplitude is given by a plus and b minus. So you see uh, a minus and b plus are known. I need a plus and b minus. Well, I can use the transfer matrix to do that. Transfer matrix by definition connects A minus B minus to A plus B plus. I substitute these two given data here and I obtain these formulas. These are equations for B minus and A plus which I need. Well, this M22 is the M22 M3 of this operator and really this is an integral equation. This is not even an equation. If you solve the first equation, you get B minus, you substitute it here, you get A plus, and you have your uh, scattering amplitude. The same construction works if you send it from the left. In this case, A minus and B plus are given by that. Again, I use the definition of my transfer matrix, and I can show that the amplitude is given by A plus and B minus again, and then, uh, I can use the definition of the transfer matrix to show that this B minus satisfies this equation and A plus given by this equation. Slightly more complicated than the right incident wave, but uh, they are at the same level of difficulty. Okay, so this is a summary of what I just told you. This slide shows that if you can determine the transfer matrix and solve these two integral equations, you have the solution of the uh, scattering problem. So transfer matrix has the full information about the scattering problem. And also you can check these. What happens if it's identity matrix? So M11 should be one, M22 should be one, and M12 should be zero. Just check these and you will see that this holds if and only if the, trans uh, the scattering amplitude is zero. That is, the potential is invisible. So this gives you a very nice criterion for omnidirectional invisibility. Omnidirectional means that it doesn't depend on the direction of the incident wave. You send the wave in any possible directions and it passes through, it doesn't scatter. Okay, now, uh, M that I introduced, it meets a Dyson series expansion in terms of a Hamiltonian. Here I need another operator, which is a projection. It projects all functions uh, by erasing their values outside the interval minus k to k. It's a projection, right? You have a me potential, I just delete the value, put it equal to zero outside the interval, and that gives me a potential, uh, that, an operator. <coughs> what about the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian has this form, which looks like the one-dimensional analog, but I have to tell you what these operators are. I put hats for operators. Omega hat is essentially multiplying functions by this square root of k squared minus p squared. So it's a multiplication operator. Y hat means the position operator in quantum mechanics. It's I squared um, derivative of uh, momentum. Um, this is the Pauli matrix, this is the matrix K that I introduced. And you can explicitly write it as a two by two matrix whose entries are operators. And these are integral operators, believe me. <coughs> and I can make it more explicit by telling you what Vx, y hat. X is a scalar, y hat is an operator. So you give me potential, I replace y dependence by y hat. So it becomes an operator. And you can show that it admits a formula in terms of this integral operator. It's a convolution essentially, which involves the 
Fourier transform of the potential with respect to y. Okay. Example. Take a potential which is a function of y times delta function evaluated at x. Well, this makes life very easy because this delta x come in here, these x's become zero, so exponentials drop. You have this formula. Okay. Remember k is this one one minus one minus one, whose square is zero. And that says if I multiply two copies of the Hamiltonian, it becomes zero, which says the Dyson series terminates. <laughs> Because you see that you have these h square and h cube, all of them are zero. So the Dyson series uh, truncates, and I can easily calculate the transfer matrix by this g y hat. Well, remember, y hat, g y hat is an integral operator I gave you. Okay, make it more specific. Take this g to be sum of some delta functions, which means the potential is sum of two-dimensional delta functions with centers on the y-axis. Now, if you teach quantum mechanics and use any textbook, all of them have the solution for this catching problem for delta function in one dimension, and none of them have the solution for two-dimensional delta functions or three-dimensional delta functions, because if you apply lippmann schwinger equation, it leads to infinities. And you have to regularize these infinities and renormalize the coupling constants and use this machining of renormalization to make sense of the two-dimensional and three-dimensional delta functions. It's a very nice thing to teach renormalization, by the way. <coughs> well, you just take this, this form here, and you find out that Nothing blows up. What you find is this expression for the scattering amplitude with AM inverse, these are the entries of the inverse of this matrix, where this special J zero function appears. Nothing blows up, no renormalization. Now, what happens if you use Lippmann Schwinger equation? You get the same formula for the scattering amplitude. But when you calculate this matrix, the diagonal entries blows up. And you have to regularize this diagonal entries. There are dozens of papers written on this. Uh, and you do any kind of renormalization you wish. And then you renormalize your coupling constants Zn's. And you find this formula. But you have a Hankel function, not Bessel. So they give different results. Now, if you have one delta function, and almost all the papers written on this subject only considered one delta function, well, this Bessel and Hankel aren't there because m is equal to n, and you have this form, and I had this form. It's exactly the same thing, except in the standard method, you have to put re renormalized coupling constant. In my method, it's just a coupling constant which comes into play from the beginning. But there is a discriminancy. One of them has H0, the other is J0, right? So you might say, well, one of them is wrong. Well, the natural reaction is that your result is wrong because this is Lippmann Schwinger. <laughs> By the way, Schwinger was my academic grandfather. <laughs> But it's just the opposite. To see that, consider taking two of the centers of the delta function and approaching them. And look at the coincidence limit, right? At the coincidence limit, Hankel function will blow up. <laughs> if Hankel function blows up, uh, you can show oops, that these blow up and the inverse becomes zero. You get zero transmission amplitude, um, scattering amplitude, which is nonsense, right? You have scatterers, <laughs> it should, they should scatter. Well, if two of the delta functions collide, you just lose one of the delta functions, 
So the same formula should apply with one less delta function, right? Well, it turns out that our results precisely does that for you, which is completely non-trivial, and we proved it with two different methods. But for two delta functions, easy. You calculate everything, and you see that it returns. It turns out that this um, coincidence limit problem of the standard uh, Lippmann-Schwinger approach has to do with a hidden uh, property. But when you renormalize, the renormalized coupling constants are can be not constants. They can depend on the position of the delta functions, which is quite bad because the theory doesn't tell you how do they depend on the positions. So you can't extract further information like position of the resonances. You can't tell. No one has apparently paid attention to this. Mathematicians worked on this also, but there are problems with when more than one delta function there also. Okay, let me quickly go. So if I want to apply this problem for other examples, you see, it becomes much easier if I can truncate the Dyson series, and we actually found conditions for truncation of Dyson series, this particular Dyson series. Now, one of the conditions allowed us to get rid of all the terms here, except the first one. And that, you see, was the condition for invisibility. So that led us for, to a condition on the potential. It makes it uh, invisible. If you demand that the terms in the series starting from the second one are zero, like delta function case, we proved that is the case when the first point approximation becomes exact. Now, have you ever seen an example of a potential for which the first point approximation is exact? Huh? But that's not short range. Just short range potential, the standard potentials. In three dimension, it Coulomb potential, but that's long range. Well, I had not seen, <laughs> and I couldn't find. Well. This allowed us to build such potentials. And this is the result. Take an arbitrary positive number alpha and some unit vector. We are in two dimensions in the xy plane, so this is it. And consider the potentials whose Fourier transform vanishes under this condition. This essentially gives you a half of the space, the green area. This is the line u dot p is equal to alpha. So suppose the potential has this property. So I'm asking uh, the Fourier transform of the potential to vanish on half of the space given by this unit vector, right? Then you can show that the first point approximation becomes exact when the uh, wave number is less than or equal to alpha. And when it is less than or equal to alpha over two, the potential becomes invisible, completely invisible. And you might say, well, how strong this condition is. Ah, it's not a very strong condition. You can easily found, find infinitely many potentials that satisfy this condition. Well, this condition, you can write it like that because the, you see Fourier transform, you can shift by multiplying by exponential function. And then you choose any continuous function here, that potential will satisfy that condition for you. And I have chosen why had to be um, my direction, you had, uh, because it's my choice of <laughs> choosing the, the, the axes. So if you, for example, take this function to be q to the n e to the minus lq for some l positive number in this range of x and zero otherwise, the potential turns out to be like that. So it vanishes uh, outside the strip, and inside the strip, it has this y dependence. It's a complex potential, and this satisfies this condition. So the first born approximation becomes exact if the wave number of the incident wave is less than alpha. And alpha is your choice. So you can make it as big as you like. 
Now, the next step was to generalize this to three dimensions and then to electromagnetic scattering. It took us uh, not much to generalize to three dimensions, but electromagnetic scattering is much more difficult and we managed to do it. Well, the only, what happens is that rather than a potential, you have the permittivity and permeability tensors. I allow them to be complex, three by three matrices, which can depend on position. So this is completely general linear scattering medium, uh, which even can have loss and gain, very general. So the role of potential is played by the difference of the, uh, these tensors from the identity matrix. And everything generalized, but I will not like to give you the details, it's a little more complicated formulas. Now, we use this dynamical formulation of electromagnetic scattering to give exact solution for the scattering by a planar array of delta functions, uh, point scatters. Whether they are like a uh, optical crystal or arbitrarily positioned doesn't matter. And this is one of the things that you couldn't do <laughs> with the ordinary methods. The ordinary methods, uh, even with one delta function, which means this particular form for the uh, epsilon, even for isotropic case, you are <laughs> collide with infinities and the renormalization is much more difficult. Uh, there's a, I found a review paper which does this and in the review paper, it spends five pages of discussing how you should renormalize one delta function. And this method doesn't give you any infinities. You don't worry about renormalization. Everything is finite. And for one delta function, you get the same result. Uh, we also generalize the result for exactness of the firstborn approximation in this paper. So there are essentially the same kind of conditions on epsilon and mu. And we used it to get invisible configurations in three dimensions. These are invisible for all waves with arbitrary polarization and wave numbers below some cutoff that you, we, we can choose uh, ourselves. So this is the theorem about the exactness of the first born approximation. We needed these two technical conditions on epsilon 33, the last entry of epsilon and mu. We demand that the real part should be bounded below from by some positive number, and they should be bounded matrices, but these conditions are almost always true. <laughs> you have to be uh, very uh, work very hard to find the, the specific material which violate these conditions. And we demand that if this eta, which is epsilon minus one, and mu, eta mu, epsilon mu minus one, their Fourier transform vanish on the half space this time, then the firstborn approximation becomes exact for wave numbers less than alpha, and the potential or this uh, scattering medium becomes omnidirectionally invisible for wave numbers less than half alpha over two. And this is an example for a Isotropic medium, I didn't want to give uh, unisotropic ones because they are matrices. So you choose this particular configuration which is confined in a box uh, in the space. Along the y direction, it has this um, y dependence. Otherwise it is zero, so it's inside a box, rectangular box and but these choices, I mean, there are several parameters you can work with. This n is a positive integer. Alpha, L are positive numbers. A, B are positive numbers. So with these, uh, you get this kind of real and imaginary part for the uh, epsilon minus 1. And this is non-magnetic, so mu is equal to 1. Okay, so let me conclude. Well, this dynamical formulation of scattering, uh, stationary scattering uh, corresponds really to the fact that the transfer matrix in one dimension and higher dimensions is actually given by time evolution operator for some uh, effective quantum system, which is 
non-unitary because the Hamiltonian is not admission, and it is non-stationary because x plays the role of time. And this, even in one dimension, has a lot of applications. I've written several uh, papers in one dimension. Today I talked about the singularity free treatment of point scatters, which is one aspect of this application of this. Exactness of the first Born approximation, which is a very, very old problem. Born approximation was uh, discovered by Max Born in 1926. <laughs> and since then, it's standard material in textbooks. And none of the textbooks tell you under what conditions it is exact. <laughs> and here I gave you potentials which are not weak, uh, but Born approximation becomes exact for them. I talked about broadband invisibility, uh, which you can uh, get. Well, I talked about the extension of these results to three-dimensional scattering uh, problems for scalar waves and general electromagnetic waves. Uh, I did not talk about this last topic. We found a way to use this particular transfer matrix for electromagnetic waves to solve radiation problems. And this is radiation problems in the presence of scatters. So you put, for example, an oscillator, oscillating source inside a general linear medium, which can have loss and gain regions, can be anisotropic, completely general. And you can use this transfer matrix to solve the radiation problem. In the presence of a planar array of point scatters, we could do it exactly. And this uh, recent paper, which I put on uh, archive, describes this application to radiation problems. Well, these are a list of references. Um, the first one is on the basic work in one dimension. The second one is a general review. I have written it specifically for students. It's a completely pedagogical review of the scattering in one dimension and the transfer matrix and its properties. These three papers are discussed. There's two dimensions and three dimensions, delta functions and <coughs> um, electromagnetic wave scattering. And these three preprints uh, give you exactness of the first point approximation radiation problem uh, and invisibility. Well, thank you very much. So uh, we have exactly two minutes and two ten seconds for questions. Hi, thank you for the the talk. Uh, I would like to know. Uh, so far, you have tested it for to the electromagnetic field. Do you have some constraint about um, which kind of field theory uh, has this interesting property of no necessity of uh, renormalization? I mean, for instance, if you try if you try to use this for the non-abelian gauge theories. Oh, first of all, I am not doing field theory, right? This is classical field. And usually, oh, okay, okay. yeah, this is quantum okay, mechanics, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it is completely unusual <laughs> to uh, require you to, to have the need for renormalization. But this is an aspect of delta front point scatters in two and three dimensions. Now, for other fields, well, we have done it for the scalar fields and for the electromagnetic fields, and this method works. For other fields, first of all, we have to generalize the method, which we are actually doing now, <laughs> now like for fermions. Dirac field and things like that. Okay, nice, yeah. thank you. I would also have a question. Sure. Um, can you give me a real experimental system where your Pauli basis non Hermitian Hamiltonian, which where the Born approximation is exact, is experimentally realizable? Yeah, so, so these potential, uh, hold on. this particular, uh, this is a particular permittivity profile. And it is complex. That means it has gain and loss regions. No, but, 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 I, but I talk about the one D, the one D problem, no, and so the non-emission Hamiltonian. 
1D problem. I mean, the very first slides where you explained. Okay. So where did you exactly say that a bond approximation again is exact? It's in two dimensions and three dimensions. Ah, okay, not in yeah. one dimension. Not in one dimension. So in one dimension, you cannot prove the Born approximation is exact. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I can give you one example, which is trivial. Because it's also not expected that in one dimension it's exact, yeah. Well, there is these potentials <laughs> which are invisible for all frequencies. Mm -hmm. And for them, uh, the scattering output is identically zero, and the first Born approximation gives you zero. So yeah, but, but let just this, this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and yeah. in one dimension, yeah. and can you give, I mean, where this property holds, which you have described, yeah. can you give experimental systems? Or yeah, yeah, they have actually done the experiments. In which in systems? Which systems? It's, um, it's optical system. They, these are called, um, these are potentials which, whose uh, Fourier transform vanishes on the half line. Yeah, but which system? I mean, concrete oh, physics. <laughs> well, I, I, have, I think they have done it with uh, acoustic anal analogs of the complex optical potentials. Mm -hmm. So again, you see the acoustic analogs. Yeah, yeah, but it's <laughs> physics, right? Yeah, this is exactly reproducing what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so any more questions? Any more questions? Then we go on to the next speaker. Okay.